Last week I began a new sermon series, and I'm calling this sermon series Real Church. And we're preaching out of 1 Corinthians. So why why did I choose Real Church? Because last week I talked about the messy church, and and, and Mike was saying today in in Bible study that he told me that that should be the name of the sermon series. And and, and it could be, because guess what we know about the church in Corinth? They were messy. But they were more than just messy. You see, if that's the only message we take away from Corinthians, then we're forgetting or we're not seeing the glory of God and what He is able to do, which is work with messy people to transform us. And so when I look at Corinthians, what I see is the real church. Because like I said last week, in Corinthians we see real people that are dealing with real problems. They're living in a real culture that stands against everything that God stands for. And this caused problems in their lives, and these problems entered into the church. They were causing chaos, conflict, disunity in the very body of Christ. And that's why I said last week, the real church is is, is messy. Church is simple, but man, it is hard sometimes. And when you're dealing with real people, guess what? Real hurt happens. And I say amen because God has given us the church to help us heal these hurts. But what we also saw was that a real church worships a real God. Amen. A a God who gives us the answers to all of our problems. I don't care what you are dealing with today. I don't care what hurts, what problems, what challenges, what tests are in your life right now. What I can guarantee you is this, that God has given us the answers to those problems. Because He is a God who provides for us, His children, the power of His Holy Spirit. A God who has given the church real preachers and teachers to help us understand His Word. And He has given us grace and love that will help us as believers to grow and stand firm in our faith. We also see in in 1 Corinthians a church that is, is unified. And when Christians truly love Jesus, and when we truly love one another completely and sacrificially, I told you last week, the world out there will see us living like this, And that gives them reasons to believe that Jesus truly is the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's who we're supposed to be. That is the mission. That is what we do. You want to make disciples, don't you? You want to bring your lost loved ones to Christ, don't you? You want to bring your neighbors and the stranger and even your enemies to Christ, don't you? One of the ways we do that is to be unified as the body of Christ. And I also taught last week that 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 1 Corinthians, the very first four chapters deal with a very specific problem, one of many in the church. Do you all remember what that problem is? Disunity. I love it. You guys are thinking. You guys are remembering. It's great. You see, the people in this church were actually dividing the body of Christ. They are sitting there and they're thinking that they're better than. They're better than the people who are sitting next to them. They know more. They follow the right leaders. They have better memorization of scripture. They know how to live it out in their lives. And because you're dealing with a sin that I'm not dealing with, I'm better than you. I follow Paul. He brought the church here. Well, I follow Peter. He visited and he, he, he was the very first apostle. Well, no, no, no. I follow Apollos, man. That guy knew how to preach. He was mighty in Scripture. And all of a sudden, the church is no longer lifting up Jesus, but men. The church is no longer unified under Jesus Christ, but we are dividing because we think we're better. This kind of disunity is ugly. It is dishonoring to God, and it caused lots of problems in the church. And because the watching world is looking to us to understand Jesus, when the church acts that way, guess what? In the the words of Ron Moore, the church gives Jesus a black eye. So it had to be corrected. And if that's where we left the story, we could get a little bit disheartened. Man, the church is messing up. The church is a mess. And this is just hopeless. 
But remember, I told you there was a hopeful part. Because they worshipped a real God. It was a God who revealed himself through the law and the prophets. And most importantly, God reveals himself through the living word, God in the flesh, Jesus Christ. And brothers and sisters, please hear me. Jesus is the answer to all of your problems, always. Again, some of you are hurting in your spirit. You are depressed. You are anxious. You are sad. You have broken relationships. You are overwhelmed. The answer is Jesus. Some of you are dealing with a broken body. Your health is going away. You, your eye falls out. Your knee's blowing out. You've got arthritis. Whatever the problem is, Jesus is the answer. Some of you have more bills than you have income coming in, and that is a problem in your life. And I'm telling you, Jesus is the answer. Now, I'm not saying he'll answer you the way you want every time, but living for him, surrendered to him, letting him be your strength will always be the answer. So here's a question. Again, this is interactive. I like it when you all talk back. You're doing a great job. Keep it up. Here's my question for you. If Paul spends four whole chapters... Addressing the issue of disunity, how serious do you think this problem is? Okay, you're right, by the way, A+. Plus. If, if this is such a serious problem, do you then think that it's important that we do something to be unified in the church? Oh, see, you, I, can, I can sit down now. You guys got it, right? Sermon can be done. But, but I wrote a lot, so why don't I go on? Okay, I want us to listen to what Paul actually says to these people. Remember last week I told you, we will not understand this letter correctly if we don't understand it was written to these people about specific problems and how do they understand it before we can apply it to us. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Brothers and sisters, when I was there, I could not talk to you the way I talk to people who are actually led by the Spirit. I had to talk to you like ordinary people of the world. You were like babies in Christ. And the teaching I gave you, it was like milk, not solid food. And I did this because you were not ready for solid food. And even now, you are not ready. You are still not following the Spirit. You are jealous of each other, and you are always arguing with each other. And this shows that you are still following your own selfish desires. You're acting like ordinary people of the world. One of you says, I follow Paul, and someone else says, I follow Apollos. And when you say things like that, you are acting like people of the world. Ouch. I mean, th th that seems kind of harsh. Paul just told these people that they're immature, they are childish, they are selfish, they are not being led by the Spirit. In fact, the church is acting no different than people who don't believe in Jesus Christ. Is that a problem? Yes. When we cannot be seen as being different than the world, why would people want to come to know Jesus? And, and to some... It actually may sound like Paul's being too mean, that he's being too judgmental. In fact, there are some people, even some people in the church, who might want to say, Paul, just be nice. Come on, the church, we will attract so many people if we're just nice. We will be seen as being Christians if we're just nice. We will get along with the world if we just be nice. Well, brothers and sisters, if by be nice, you mean that we're to have authentic care about someone, that if by be nice, you mean that we want the best for them, then I'm going to tell you I'm all for that. Let's truly love people. But if by be nice, you mean we got to be pleasant, if by be nice, we can't upset anyone, if by be nice, you say the children of God, the sanctified of the church, need to get along with the world and not do anything that anyone's going to get upset about. Can I simply say this? 
It is that kind of sentiment that has been one of the most damaging fake Christian sayings of the last 40 years. Oh, come on. We got to be seeker sensitive. We got to stop being judgmental. We got to stop talking about sin. We got to stop talking about the expectation of the church. We got to stop talking about the commands of God because we turn people off. So let's just be nice. Well, can I just tell you biblically? The church was not given to us so that we can get along with the world and be just like them. No, the church is supposed to be the place where we go and transform the world. Yes, the church is supposed to be meek. We are supposed to be gentle. But we have never been called to be weak and to be inoffensive. And if you're going to stand on biblical truth, guess what? you're going to offend somebody. If you believe Jesus is who he said he was and he commands us to follow him, sacrificially giving up our will for the will of God, someone's going to get upset in your life. I don't care if it's your work. I don't care if it's at school. I don't care if it is in your home with family. The message of Christ is offensive to people who are in the world. And that sometimes the truth is this, that truly caring about someone means that we are going to have to have difficult conversations about where they're at in their life. Because the true definition of be nice is loving someone enough that I'm going to risk upsetting them because I want to help them. I'm going to be willing to upset people because I am not comfortable with people going to hell. Oh, I can't upset them. They may not like me. They may tell people I'm a Bible thumper. They may get angry at me. So to avoid that, I'm going to say it's okay that you go to hell. Understand what be nice truly is supposed to mean. And then when we do upset people, which we're going to, it's going to happen. Guess what? We're going to upset one another, much less people in the world. Be nice means that we're committed and we're willing to work through the problems to bring about reconciliation. You see, the world to be nice is too easy. In the church, it's being willing to do the hard things for the glory of God and for the salvation of people. Let me, let me continue to you, show you what I mean. Why this is important we get this right. Yes, Paul did say hard things to these people. Yes, I am sure that when they got done reading that letter, they're all in the gathering and someone is there and saying, Paul sent us a letter, we're so excited. And they're reading this and I'm sure they're not happy. And as the letter goes on, I'm sure that they were more and more unhappy. But listen to what else he says to the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. I'm not trying to make you feel ashamed, but I am writing this to counsel you as my own dear children. You may have 10,000 teachers in Christ, but you don't have many fathers. And through the good news, I became your father in Christ. So I beg you, yes, I beg you to be like me. Paul calls out the church rightly for the disunity they were bringing into the body of Christ, for bragging about their own spiritual maturity when really what they are is immature. It's kind of like today, I mean, you would have someone who says, I don't need to go to Bible study. I already know all that stuff. Or, I don't need to go to Sunday worship because I can worship at home. And it doesn't affect me if I sleep in or if I go fishing or if I go to the game or if I do anything else. It's going to be fine. I'll just worship Jesus on my own. But you see, the Bible doesn't know 
a Christian who worships in isolation. The church is a family, the church is a body, and we are part of this all together. This church, because they thought they were better than, they're putting other people down. They're filled with pride. They're filled with arrogance. They're filled with selfishness. And Paul calls them out and he says, but I did not call you out to make you feel bad about yourselves. I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm not trying to belittle you. Instead, Paul says, I am calling you out because I love you. And I have hope that there can be change, there can be transformation, that you can mature in your walk with Christ. You see, this is Paul showing the love he has as a father to these people that he brought the gospel to. Yeah, they're going to have tons of teachers. They're going to have lots of people that will come in and want to show them what it means to follow Christ but they're going to have very, very few fathers who love them enough to correct them. Now listen, some of you are parents. Some of you have raised kids. Did you discipline your kids because you hate them? Did you correct the bad behavior because they're rotten little snots and you just wanted them out of your house? Why did you correct your children? Why did you have those uncomfortable conversations where they're across the table, you're in the bedroom, wherever you're having those conversations? Because kids will have conversations in the weirdest places. Bathroom. So they will, you're in the bathroom. I want to talk now, Dad. No. But you have those hard conversations and they get upset. They get angry. They walk away. Maybe there's a little bit of fracture there. And what do you say to them? I did it because I love you. Now, now Paul's not telling the church to call him father. Because what he's getting at is not that there's a title that you're supposed to call me this or you're supposed to call me that. Instead, what Paul is showing the church and what we can learn from this is what the roles and responsibilities are in the church. And that he has this role. He has these God-given responsibilities in their spiritual lives. So, so please hear me. I mean, I think this is a great lesson that we can get out of 1 Corinthians. That true pastors of the flock will always see their role and responsibility in the church as one that is grounded not in power and authority, not lording it over the sheep, but instead it is grounded in love and service to God and to you. We must lead, we must encourage, we must correct, and yes, leaders must discipline. But I want you to hear this, I want you to understand my heart. I promise you, I have never and I never will take this position as being of worldly authority and power. Like Paul, I never try to intentionally hurt you, shame you, or belittle you. If I have had to have a difficult conversation with you, if I have had to bring correction or discipline into your life, it's because of this deep well of love I feel for God and for each and every one of you. And I take the responsibility that God has placed onto me of the utmost seriousness to lead the church well. I take serious the call on this church that we are to be unified so we can go and make disciples. And I can guarantee you this, each and every one of your leaders have that same heart. You may not feel it, but we're not about feelings. You may not want to accept it, but I'm telling you, if Mike has gotten in your face, if he's offended you, if he's hurt you, it's because he loves you. When when Don was on, even now, Don not actively being an elder, 
will sometimes offend you. I guarantee you, he has only ever done what he's done because he loves you. The same is true for Dan and Ben and all the other elders. That's who we are. And I want you to understand this because again, when your kids are hurt because you have had to correct them, what is it you pray and hope the most your kids will do after they get through the hurt feelings? Say it louder because I can't hear you. Make to make the right choices. But what do you want your relationship to be like? Closer than ever. Just because someone gets hurt doesn't mean we split and run from the family. What I want more than anything else is for each and every one of us as the church to be successful in the ministry that God has called us to. The call for each and every one of us to know Jesus personally and intimately. And for the port to be a place of transformation and for us to make disciples. What would it be like if because of the ministry of this congregation, we were not just full, but we were busting the walls down. And one day while we're in heaven, we're in the very presence of God. Someone comes up to you and says, thank you. Thank you so much. I am here because you shared Jesus with me. This isn't about us come, getting together and having a good time. This isn't about us having fun. We do all of that, but that's not what it's about. It's about us honoring God and us making the kingdom available to people who are lost. And, and in this section of text, Paul shows us that there is only one way. There is only one way that we will ever rise to the challenge of this kind of unity. There is only one way that we are ever going to achieve success in ministry the way that God has laid out before us. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 9, that last half of 9 through 11. Paul is talking about how the church operates and, and that, that he and the other elders and leaders are, are just servants under God. And he says, and you are a house that belongs to God. Like an expert builder, I built the foundation of that house. He brought the gospel to Corinth. I use the gift that God gave me to do this. This isn't about him. This is about God always. He said, other people are building on that foundation. You can have other teachers come and they're going to help you go beyond and, and learn more. And I'm not going to be with you all the time, but they're going to build on the same foundation. But then a warning. But everyone should be careful how they build. The foundation that has already been built is Jesus Christ, and no one can build on any other foundation. Do you see what the essential is for biblical unity? Biblical unity can only come when the real church is built on Jesus. That's why we're here today. That is what our lives are about. That is the only message that we have is Christ and Christ crucified. There's no other name under heaven given by which men may be saved. It is Jesus all the time. And Mike always says this. I don't know if you've picked up on it. He kind of stopped for a while, but he's getting back into it. This is a famous, I've actually got some of his quotes written down on my computer to remember. From the day I got here until now, Mike says, you win them to what you win them with. And that's why here, we're not about pizza parties. We're not about fundraisers. We're not about big flashy events. We're not about door prizes. We're not about these emotional events where everyone will get up and start crying and all these different concerts and all the things that you can do that are fun. Because you can build a lot of excitement with that stuff. You, you can get a lot of people doing a lot of things and you can get a lot of people coming in to the building and you can have amazing growth. But what doesn't happen is you don't build the church. You see, here, I will guarantee you for as long as I am here, what we teach, what we believe, how we live, who we are, will only be found and lived out in personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's who we are. And the only way we as individuals and we as a church will ever experience the success that we want to have in the kingdom of God 
is if our foundation of the church and our foundation of each and every one of your lives is found only in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. If we try to build this church on anything else, I don't care even if it's good things. It could be things like feeding the hungry, giving something to drink to someone who's thirsty, clothing the naked, giving hospitality to the homeless, giving mercy to the poor in spirit. We can do all of those things and still not be biblically unified if they are done without Jesus being the foundation and the power of those good deeds. Because if Jesus is not the reason why we do these things, if Jesus is not at the center of all of these things, if Jesus is not the purpose that we get to share Jesus with other people doing all this stuff, then I'm going to tell you, all that stuff is meaningless. In the kingdom of God, it's nothing. And there are too many people in the church that are too hyped up about doing good works to do good works. And there are churches that have left Jesus out of their service. There are churches that have left Jesus out of their worship. Why? Because they're following a model to be exciting so they can get numbers. They have turned the church of Christ. They have turned the body of Jesus into a business. So if we do not preach Jesus, if we do not live Jesus, if we do not share Jesus, if we do not love Jesus, then we are nothing except a glorified social club that's pretending to be the church and will never have biblical unity. You'll have a lot of business. You'll have a lot of excitement, but you'll have a lot of infighting. You'll have a lot of people scrabbling and striving and fighting to get their needs met or their pet ministry done instead of surrendering their lives and sacrificing everything for the good of God. And just so you know, because Jesus has been called to be our foundation we got to figure out how that works in the church. And you know what God did for us so that we can be sure that Jesus is the foundation of our church? He's gifted us elders. Literally, they're, they're a gift to the church. They are to be godly men of the church who have been called by God, not by the preachers, not by you guys, not by vote, not by opinion, but called by God. To uphold the teachings of God in the church. To make sure that Jesus is the center and the foundation of church life. These are the men who are supposed to search God's word for God's will. And then they make sure the church is built upon the person of Jesus Christ. And I know that's hard for some people. But what about me? Don't I get a vote? No, we don't vote because the Bible doesn't talk about voting. Well, I I, I just, I'm a leader, not a follower. That's great. You can lead in your jobs. But if you've not been called to be an elder, you're not to lead in the church. And I know in the culture we live in right now, this is a culture kind of like Corinth. that praises independence. I'm my own man. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm a pull myself up by a bootstraps kind of guy. And no one, absolutely no one, none of you are going to tell me what to do with my life. I mean, right? That's the American way. And because that's the culture we live in, it can be very hard for all of us to voluntarily submit to the elders. All of us. Because even the preacher as an elder is still called to submit to the other elders. No one can go lone wolf rogue in the church. All of us are accountable. All of us. And it's hard. But it's what we're called to do. Here's one place. Hebrews chapter 13. Remember your leaders. They taught God's message to you. Remember how they lived and died and copy their faith. Jumping down to verse 17. Obey your leaders. Be willing to do what they say. They are responsible for your spiritual welfare. So they are always watching to protect you. 
Obey them so that their work will give them joy, not grief. It won't help you to make it hard for them. As a leader in the church, that is an amazingly uncomfortable scripture to read because it feels self-serving. But it's not about me. It's about God. It's about you. And the text actually means obey. Give your elders the opportunity to serve you and to lead you. It's not about lording it over. It's not about power. It's not about subjugation where I'm going to come out there and I'm going to put you down and make you do what I think you should do. That is nothing to do with biblical leadership. It is us sacrificially and with a servant's heart living our lives in such a way that we become an example to you, that we are responsible for protecting the congregation, the flock, for teaching and preaching appropriate biblical doctrine, and you choose to submit to the authority of God by listening to us. And you got a brain. I mean, if we're unbiblical, we're unbiblical, and you guys will deal with that. But if you just don't like someone telling you what to do, even something biblical, like come to the gathering and participate, be a part of the body, don't just be like, a hanger on, but actually be in the lifeblood of the church. Do it. Or don't. But you'll have to answer for that. And I know some of you, believe it or not, I know some of you get a little offended because, can I tell you a secret? I know I can tell Miss Eunice a secret. You'll keep the, the, the confidence. Mike can be a little annoying sometimes. Mike can sound a little abrasive sometimes. George can be annoying sometimes. George can be very offensive sometimes. Yeah. I don't know if you've all noticed, but Scott is preaching. Guess what he's starting to do now? Yeah, you know, you've listened. Some things are starting to come out. That's because we have a heart that loves you deeply and loves Jesus Christ. And now you can talk to us and you can explain to us, hey, you, you said that kind of harsh or you embarrassed me. And oh, I'm sorry, I never meant to embarrass you. And I will make amends for that. But what I will not apologize and what I will not stop doing is teaching this congregation to follow Jesus Christ. And if you get a problem with that, guess what? You've got a problem with that. We can work it out. But the problem is not in the leadership. The problem is not in the word of God. The problem is in the fact that we all have prideful, selfish, egotistical self that wants to place ourselves as God of our own lives. I'm telling you all this because it's time. We want the church to be practical. We actually here at the port want to be living life God's way. And if we want to live God's way, guess what? We have to know what God's way actually is. And that's why you have leaders. Because what the church cannot do, what we can never do, is all of us leave here today, go home, and decide for ourselves what the correct doctrines of the church look like for me, for my family. The Bereans gathered together, searched scripture together, and worked this out together. Now, am I saying you're going to agree 100% on the church teachings? No. But we never, we never as a church need to be saying, how many things can I disagree about and still be able to come here? It should be, okay, this is what the elders are teaching. How do I get close to that? Like, what do I not know? What do I not understand? Give them the opportunity to explain in their teaching. You can come talk to us in the office. We will go through the things that you may not agree with. But your responsibility is to say, how close to the church can I get? Not how close to the edge and still say I'm here. Because guess what happens if you play this game of how close to the edge can I get and still be a part of this church? 
It's only a matter of time you're going to fall. And I have watched it play out in this congregation where someone gets upset about a teaching of the church. Someone gets upset about something that I have said, Mike has said, or the elders have said. And instead of handling it biblically, coming here and working through it, they leave. That is not what we've been called to. Please understand that if we live that way, then we will become just like the church in Corinth. And does anyone here want to be like the church in Corinth in this way? No. So understand that God in his wisdom has given the church the ministry of the elders to help lead us in holiness. And we are called to submit in the gathering of believers to the godly leadership that is over us. And I'm begging you, I am begging you from the bottom of my heart, let us hear scripture, let us be transformed by scripture, let us sacrificially go to live out scripture. Here are the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. I did this so that you could learn from us the meaning of the words, follow what the scripture says. Paul wrote that so the church would be able to grow and be transformed by the word of God. How many times have you heard Mike or Scott, me or the elders say this? Don't take our word for it, but go search the scripture. We do not demand, require, or want blind obedience. If you have questions, we want to help you answer them. But we want to be unified as a church. Again, please, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to hammer this point. Everything that Mike and everything the elders do is done because we love God and we love you and we want to actually follow what the scripture says. Or more simply, we want to live life God's way. That's what this year is all about. Every sermon, every class, everything we're doing is so that we can live practically the way God wants us to live. Well, last week I showed you that Paul, as Paul often does, before he talked about the problems in the church, he gave the answer for how you fix the problem of disunity. He did that in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Do you all remember verse 10? He said, brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, I beg all of you to agree with each other. Church, get along in Christ. Find out what Jesus' will is and then do that. You should not be divided into different groups. You should not be talking about each other. You should not dislike certain people or think you're better than them. Instead, be completely joined together with the same kind of thinking and the same purpose. This isn't the only time that Paul said something like this, because this is important. This week, I want to hear for us Paul's words to the church in Ephesus. Ephesus chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Paul says, So as a prisoner for the Lord, I beg you. Oh, do you keep hearing that word, the language? Where's Paul's heart if he's begging the church? This matters. I beg you to live the way God's people should live, because he chose you to be his. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient and accept each other with love. You are joined together with peace through the Spirit. Do all you can to continue as you are, letting peace hold you together. Be patient with each other and accept each other with love. Is the church magically all going to get along? No. When we all became saved, did did God force us to all become completely uniformed in our thinking? No. Unity is not uniformity. We will not all think the same, look the same, sound the same. And the truth is this. I learned this up in Greensburg from a wonderful elder. I brought it here. Sometimes you run across people who are EGR. What's that stand for? Extra grace required. There will be people in the church that you will have to make the determination to love them in a Christ-like way more because they're that annoying. 
They're that difficult. And guess what? There's always at least one in any group. So look around. Whenever you're with a bunch of other Christians, look around and guess what? If you don't find the EGR tag, you're it. And don't feel bad, because here's a secret. Each and every one of us are EGR at some point. All of us need a little extra grace. And I'm joining with Paul, and I'm begging each and every one of us to live in unity as the body of Christ. That's our call. But to do that, we have to make a decision every day. Every day, you get to decide to make the foundation of our lives the person of Jesus Christ. Not a preacher, not the Bible, not this church building, not your personal ministry, but Jesus Christ has to be the foundation of my life. And then because Jesus is the foundation of our lives, We are to live submitted to the Spirit of God. You cannot do this without God in your life. We are to be humble and gentle and patient with one another in love. What's biblical love? Does biblical love mean that you like me all the time or you feel warm fuzzies for me? No. Biblical love mean you think I'm a great guy all the time? No. Biblical love mean you think I'm easy to get along with? No. Biblical love is the sacrificial love of Jesus Christ, who in obedience to the Father went to the cross to pay for your sin. Will you love one another that way? Because unity is not being a Bible scholar. Is not having all the answers, knowing all the words, memorizing all the scripture. That stuff is simply head knowledge. There is a place for it, but it is not the foundation of our life. And that kind of stuff can actually lead to disunity if you're not founded in Jesus. Because people will argue over all kinds of dis- dis- disputable matters. And there's been too much arguing over these kinds of things in the church. And we've been specifically told to not do this. Romans chapter 14, verse 1, Paul says, Accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. Well, George, I don't think that's right. I don't think you said that right. I don't think you did that right. I don't like the translation you used. I don't like the music you picked. I don't like the fact that you're using this stand. I don't like the fact you're not wearing a tie. There's all sorts of things we can argue over. There's all kinds of things we can be... Uh, in, in, in disunity over. But none of it matters if Jesus is the foundation of our lives. So brothers and sisters, here's the truth. Biblical unity is simple. It's just not easy. It's simple because all it requires is that we build our lives on Jesus and then live life as the scriptures require us to. But oh, is that so very, very hard to achieve. But if I really want biblical unity, if I actually mean I want the church to be unified, then I have to realize it's not about other people changing to make me happy or make my life easy. It's not about me wanting other people to change so they agree with my interpretation of scripture. It is not me getting everyone else to act the way George wants so church becomes really easy for me. Instead, true biblical unity will be my personal choice to have a personal relationship with Jesus and then for me to choose to live that out. Biblical unity starts with you. It starts with me. And church, if we really want to be unified biblically, you and me, today, we have to accept the responsibility to surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in my life, to know the Word of God, to know the will of God, and then to live God's way. Let's pray.
Father God, I come before you and I thank you for who you are. I, I thank you for your word that every single time I'm reading the Bible, it is new and it is fresh and it is relevant to my life today, to the church today. You truly have given us all the answers we need. And Father, the very first thing we need is to accept you as our Lord and our Savior. So Father God, help us, help the church to, to surrender daily, to pick up that cross daily and follow after you, to, to, to not let the world get in the way and, and have you be just an addition to our life. Please, please, Lord, help each and every one of us to make you the foundation for our good, but for your glory and for the kingdom's growth. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.